Hello, Construct2 developers. This is a quick intro on how to publish from Construct2 to the OUYA. Now, we've created a new plugin, and I'll show you how to get that set up. So first, in the OUYA SDK examples, there's a Construct2 folder for that the engine. All right, and now there's two different folders within here. So the OUYA plugin changes are in program files. The virtual controller folder has the virtual controller example. That every engine gets a virtual controller example. Okay, to get started, you want to go to your program files and drop in the new plugins. Construct2 has a plugin folder, and when you get the OUYA SDK examples, I've made a couple different changes. All right, so GamePad is a plugin. It uses the JavaScript GamePad API. I made some changes to the edit time JavaScript so that it would show the OUYA controller buttons when you pick an accessor button. And there's some runtime changes, which were just a little bit more error handling uh, doing undefined checks. Okay, so there's those two files for GamePad. And then other than the GamePad API changes, there's the OUYA SDK plugin that's gonna provide in-app purchase API um, events that you can use within Construct2 and also the controller hooks so that you can use the GamePad API that you're used to on the OUYA in our custom build of Chromium. Both these plugins go within program files, and then you want to restart Construct2. When you launch Construct2, open the project. You're going to want to navigate to where you've checked out the ODK examples, go into Construct2 for the engine, virtual controller, and you'll find the virtual controller example. Okay, so this has a layout, and it's got an event sheet, for all the events that are hooked to the layout. The first thing to notice on the layout is all these sprites, which are all images of the virtual controllers. And based on input, the sprites will get toggled on or off. So there's four of each sprite for each of the four controllers. If I scroll down here, there's also the four controller images that are on the background at the bottom layer, and everything else sits on top of that. There's gamepad for the hooks into the gamepad. And also, this main one, you want to have one instance of the OUYA SDK in the layout. And that basically adds all the hooks that are necessary for Chromium to translate into the gamepad API that Construct2 supports. And that, that will support OUYA Everywhere input. It'll work with tons of controllers on the OUYA. Okay, and then the last thing is this label here, this text object. So a hello world script that you're running the virtual controller for Construct2. Okay, next thing, the event sheet. The event sheet has some globals at the top. Uh, these are just global variables that are reused for various things. The access scaler changes how much the button sprites move on the virtual controller. Five seems to be about right. Rotate by cosine, rotate by sine. These two are pre-calculated cosine and sine values for rotating the input 135 degrees because you'll notice the controller's oriented this way and the virtual controller picture. So I take the regular input that comes through and I just rotate it around so that it matches this orientation. Okay, then there's a dead zone for the triggers so that when the trigger values hit 0.25, it will toggle the triggers and make a toggle the visibility of the two trigger sprites on each controller. Okay, and then you have an event sheet, and in the event sheet, these are groups that I've labeled. Each group of controllers is in a group labeled controller one through four, and if you expand a controller, each of these are the same, except for obviously the gamepad, when it's checking for the button down, you'll see parameters for checking if it's the button down, and it passes the gamepad ID. The gamepad is zero based, and then it's checking is a button down based on the button drop down. And here's some of the gamepad changes that I made for the gamepad edit time script, which was just to make sure that the OUYA labels are in here. So it's the Xbox values on the left, and then the OUYA buttons on the right, so you know what each map to. It's an easy lookup for the buttons you want to map to. Okay, so all the button presses are basically the same. It's an event, so basically when this event happens, 
it's going to trigger an action. And then there's an else case here. So when the button's down, it hits this true block and runs this, this row. In the else case, when the button's not down, it's going to hide the visibility of the button. Okay, so that's the action. And if I double click the action, if I go back and back. Okay, so normally when you add an action, you come to this screen. It lists all the objects that are in the layout. And I've selected the O button on the first controller. So I'm, that's saying, hey, I want to interact with this, right? Next. Then I want to invoke one of these appearance actions. So we wanted to affect the visibility. So I'm running the set visible action. Next. And then the visibility action has a parameter. In this case, you can say visible or, or not visible. And I'm saying visible. So you'll notice the true case sets it visible. So when the button is down, the red sprite becomes visible. The else case, the red sprite becomes invisible. Construct 2 is pretty easy to set up. It's visually based. Like I can delete the action by deleting it. I can click on the visible action, control C to copy, click on the else block, control V to paste, and then it pastes the same action there. And then double click on the action and I can change it to invisible. And that's a quick way to set up a block for a single button on a single controller. It's the same thing for each of these other buttons. You'll notice the event, if I go back on the event, back, back, okay. So when adding the initial event, it's a gamepad event. Next, I'm using the input events is button down. Next, the gamepad values can be zero, one, two, and three. And then you specify what button it's interacting with. So the button you want to detect. This is saying when the O button is pressed, the event is going to fire. When the event fires, then it executes the action, in which case it makes the O button sprite visible or not visible. Okay, so most of the buttons are all the same, except for when we get to the axes below. Here we go. So for, for the axes, I used a system event every tick. So this is on the update event. Go back. Okay, so adding an event, I pick system, picked every tick because I want it to update using the access position. There's a variety of every tick actions here. For the left stick and the right stick, I used an every tick event and they're tied to various actions. So for the left stick, first I selected an action that's related to a sprite. And the sprite ends up being at the axis on the left. Okay, this action uses the left stick for the first controller. Next, I'm setting the position of the left stick sprite. Next, and then I'm calculating where the X and Y should be. All right, so this value is going to be the position of the controller because we want to have the axis input move the little stick sprite relative to where the controller is placed. The scalar indicates how much we're moving it so that it stays within the little controller area. And then we have our little rotation calculation. This is the calculation for taking the raw access input and gamepad raw access is important. The first parameter zero is the controller number. The second parameter is the access number. So for the left stick on the X, that's the zero index. Left stick on the Y is axis one. And to rotate the axis, you need both components to rotate. The X component is X times cosine minus Y times sine. The Y component is X times sine plus Y times cosine. Anyways, that rotates the input. And uh, so once it calculates that, it tells it where the left stick sprite needs to be. Now the L3 button shows on top of the stick when you've pressed the L3 button. And so for that calculation, we can just say, hey, put the L3 sprite on top of 
where the left stick axis already is. So you only have to calculate it once. And then the same calculation happens for the right stick. So the right stick, start from the controller position, tell it how much we want to move, and then rotate the X, the X and Y values for the right stick. It's important to use gamepad.raw access to access the access values. It's the first parameter for raw access is the controller number, so 0, 1, 2, or 3. And second parameter is the access number. The right stick X is the 3 index. Right stick Y is the or index 4. And then there's that rotation calculation again. Okay, for the R3 sprite, we just set it to the same position where the right stick is. For the highlighted right stick, we just set it to the same position as the right axis sprite. And then down to the controllers. So controllers, again, gamepad.raw access. We're going to use the raw axis. First parameter is zero for the controller number. This is zero for the first controller. And two is for the left trigger. We just make sure it's greater than the trigger dead zone that we specified. That's a global variable. And when it's the values are greater, then we toggle the left trigger sprite on. And when it's off, we turn the left trigger sprite off when it's outside the, the dead zone. Okay, same thing for the right trigger. Again, gamepad raw access. Controller one is index zero. And the right trigger is index five. When it's bigger than the dead zone, we turn visibility on for the right trigger. And when it's outside the dead zone, we turn the right trigger sprite off by setting its visibility to invisible. Okay, and the other controllers are exactly the same. If I expand controller two, controller two index is one. So gamepad one up here was gamepad zero. Okay. All the same stuff. And then when you get to the access positioning, it's using the position of controller two, offsetting that. Gamepad.raw access specifies one for the second controller. And if we look at controller three, same thing. Controller three is actually gamepad index two. It's offsetting from the position of controller three sprite. Uses index two, again, gamepad raw access. And controller four is index three. Again, offsetting from the position of the controller four sprite using index three. Okay, so now that's a basic overview of the controller setups. If I collapse these, we had the event sheet and the layout and save changes. Okay, so now what do you do to publish to the OUYA? Well, the first step is you want to use file export project. Choose the HTML5 website option. HTML5 publishing works in all the different versions, including the free version. So next, then you choose where you want it to export. I've already got this path set where I outputs the HTML5 build files. Next and export. Okay, so it exports the project to HTML5, and then I just say go back to construct, construct 2 because I already have it open here. So if I go back, um, we've already set up the plugins. Plugins. Okay, here we go. So now I've just built this from Construct 2. So from our Construct 2 project, it's output to an HTML5 app. The next step is I select all the files that it output to HTML5, and I just right click that, and I put it into a zip file. I prefer 7-zip. You can zip it with it, your preferred zip program. And that outputs to a zip file. Now, this expands on the previous pre-builds for HTML5. If you check the documentation, 
basically I want to name this zip file web archive because I'm using the web archive pre-built templates. So I'm going to rename my build zip as web archive jar. And I'll just drag and drop this right into the HTML5 GUI project and replace it. Okay. And then I drop back to the web archive folder. The web archive pre-build is explained in the HTML5 docs. Uh, what I normally do here is you have to decode, run the decode one time and that unpacks the content shell. Okay, and then after it's unpacked, then you dr drag your web archive into the content shell res raw folder as web archive. And the other video will show you how to customize your app name and do um, various customizations. If I drop back to the web archive, then you want to build it, align it, sign it, and install it. I've just got this helper script down here called repackage, and it just runs each one in order. And that will repackage the construct to HTML5 website, put it into this Chromium custom build, and then it's going to install it on the OUYA. So it's, it's signing it with a debug key store for now. I'll make a video later about how you make a custom key store for when you finally go to publish. For this video, I'm just going to show you how to install the example on the OUYA. Okay, so it just successfully installed. Okay, so here's the virtual controller example for Construct2, and you can see all the buttons are detected. It works with multiple controllers using all that, that event sheet, drives all the button visibility toggles. So we've got D-pad, we've got left and right axes, we've got L3, R3, you can move the axis around, and if I hold down the L3 button, it's placing that highlighted L3 sprite right where the axis is. Same thing for the right axis and R3. Highlighting all the OUYA buttons. We've got left bumper, right bumper, left trigger, right trigger. And left and right trigger, we're using that dead zone. There we go. And it's using multiple controllers. Supports up to four controllers. Let me just show you one other time how I exported from Construct2. All right, so once you've got all this set up, it's as simple as file, export project, HTML5 website, next. It'll remember where you last published. Next, export. It goes and builds the HTML5 version of the website. Back to Construct2, okay. And that just exported the build in HTML5. Select all your build files. Zip it up. Okay, that makes the build zip. I go back to the web archive just to grab the name. Rename the build zip to web archive jar. Name it. Drag it back over here to put into the Chromium pre build. Go back to the web archive. Rerun repackage. Okay. It's running the APK tool that's repackaging up our changes, running zip align, signing it with a key store, verifying that it was signed, and then installing it to the OUYA. And basically what we've done here is we exported an HTML5 app, wrapped it in Chromium, and deployed it to the OUYA. And it supports the GamePad API. Okay, we deployed to the OUYA. Okay, so this was an overview of exporting the virtual controller example and construct to, to an HTML5 app, wrapping that in Chromium, running it on the OUYA, and you can see the GamePad API is working, running on the OUYA, even though it's wrapped in Chromium. All right, thanks for watching.